My uh, career as a biomedical engineer uh, um, got a very interesting start. When I was about 14 years old, I read this great article in Omni magazine about bionic people. And I was absolutely captivated by the information in it. I learned about artificial organs and artificial limbs. And I remember reading in places like Popular Science about this thing called bioelectricity, which is basically the foundation for how our neuromuscular system works. And I remember reading about this um, famous experiment done by Galvani way back in 1770, where he was able to show that small amounts of electrical current could activate the muscles of a frog. And I thought, this is really, really cool. So I actually wrote away to researchers around the country, and I wanted to know, how can I go about doing this myself? Because I had a couple of thoughts. One is, I wanted to have a really kick-ass science fair project that year. And the other is, I wanted to have a really kick-ass career. So as far as the science fair project goes, this is me at 14. <laughs> kind of a geek. Um, I developed uh, or built this system that had sensors that I could place on the surface of my skin that would pick up the bioelectric signals from my muscles. And then I built, built a little converter that would turn those signals into pulses that I could use to activate the muscles of a frog. So just to give you a sense of the you know, wonderful sophistication of my project, the sensors that I placed on my arms were coins from my piggy bank, and the conductive pace that I used was Play-Doh. So while I was busy building the Play-Doh and coins version, there were a group of researchers out at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio, who were busy laying down the foundation of this new field called neuromodulation. They were trying to do this on a much more grand scale. It wasn't just a little parlor trick of trying to activate muscles. If you can coordinate the activation of many muscles, you can create functional movement. And this is what they were trying to do. So you can think of these guys as kind of the original hackers of the human body, right? They're trying to reverse engineer the human nervous system and then develop the sensors and technologies that can interface with it. The goal that they had was to develop systems that could help people with paralysis by restoring their function. They had a, a, a vision of a future where a great technology could help people with paralysis by restoring lost function. Now, they were focused on people with paralysis, and they were primarily focused on people with spinal cord injury. Why would they do that? Well, it turns out that people living with paralysis were actually a relatively new patient population that the medical community was dealing with. Throughout most of history, spinal cord injury has been termed an ailment not to be treated. And this is how it's described in a papyrus that dates back 4,500 years ago. It was described that people could sustain a terrible blow to their back or to their neck, and they'd be fully conscious and awake and alive, but paralyzed, completely unable to move or sense anything below the level of injury. And there was nothing that could be done for these people. So for millennia, the prevailing medical management of people with spinal cord injury has been to leave them to die. And so it wasn't until around World War II that medical management improved to the point that now people could be stabilized and they could learn to live and manage themselves as people with paralysis for many, many years. So that by the time our researchers in Cleveland were getting underway, there was now this growing population of people living stably with paralysis. As you can imagine, life with paralysis has a great deal of challenges to it, a great deal of complexity. Depending on their level of injury, people may need attendant care for many of their activities of daily living. But these are people who are not asking for our pity. In fact, they had dreams and aspirations before their injury, and they continue to have those dreams and aspirations. They just try to achieve them in a, in a body that works differently. So they do amazing things. They show incredible resilience in the face of their new reality, a new reality that involves working within the limits of their condition, working with hands that don't work, attending to bodily functions like bladder control and bowel control that are no longer fully under their voluntary control, and dealing with issues of access and mobility. So a prevailing sentiment that they express is that they simply lack the freedom to feel spontaneous. 
think about that. Although I think these pictures sort of belie that a little bit. <laughs> these are people with, with tetraplegia and doing things like tandem jumping out of an airplane and kayaking and scuba diving. One of the big issues here is there aren't great technologies to help them. So it's true that we no longer leave these people to die. But my gosh, we do send them home from rehab with precious little else. You know, it's been more than half a century since we've learned to create this population, but all we can send them home with are simple tools. So I, I look at this and I think we've got to do better than this. We've got to do better than this because it's not just that living with paralysis takes a toll on people's sense of independence and autonomy and, and flexibility and spontaneity. It takes a toll on their lives. And this became abundantly clear to me when I was working with people with spinal cord injury. It horrified me to learn what it is that they die from. Because it's stuff that you and I don't think about every day. They can die from infections that rage through the body, sometimes started off as something as simple as a pressure sore that they didn't notice because they sat too long in the same position. They can die from pneumonia because many times their respiratory system is compromised and they might not be able to generate a productive cough. And they can die from kidney failure because of the constant pressure that's placed on the renal system because of the complexity and challenges of having to manage their bladder. So all of these things, all of these things can be improved by restoring simple basic functions, getting people the ability to get up again, to move again, to shift their weight in their chair, to use their hands again, to feed themselves, to pee, to breathe better. If you can restore these basic functions, you can potentially save their lives. So here's the thing about that. When it comes to restoring the basic functions of paralysis, there's no app for that. There's no really simple tool. There's no few lines of code that you can push out of the App Store or Nervous System 1.0. There's no cute little gadget that you can build in a couple of months and, and set it up on Indiegogo. <laughs> There's probably not a DIY version that's available. The fact is, the artificial nervous system which is what we're talking about, is an effort that's been underway for 30 years because that's what it takes. That's what it takes to completely reverse engineer the human nervous system, to develop all the technology that's going to interface with it, to figure out how to uh, make the system biocompatible, to fully test it, to teach people how to implant it, to teach patients how to use it, and to teach rehab specialists how to program it. This is what it takes. So here's where we are today. The artificial nervous system that we're talking about looks like this. These are what neuro neuromodulation systems look like today. This is a fourth generation design. So this design can trace its lineage all the way back to some of the first systems that were hand built in the 70s and 80s. And they can trace that lineage back because some of the same people are still working on that team. It is a tour de force of great engineering and a, a wonderfully elegant design. All the system component parts are now implanted, so the whole thing is on the inside of the body. And it works like a network computer system, modular, so that um, the, the components talk to each other. And if you want to add new functionality, it's like adding peripherals. So one of the hidden um, points of simplicity in this design is the fact that it uses as much as possible the person's own residual function. And this is really, really key. So you'll notice it's not a robotic system. And it's not an exoskeleton. And there's a design reason for that. Just look at people with paralysis. They already have a skeleton. They wear it on the inside. And they don't need a lot of motors and actuators because movement can come from their muscles that can still be activated. This system connects to the part of their nervous system that still works. And it substitutes for the parts that don't. So this is the artificial nervous system that can bring and restore lost functions of paralysis to people with spinal cord injury. So 
I realize that at this point, you're thinking, OK, great, problem solved, way to go on the bionic guy. And a lot of people would see this as a problem with an engineering solution. But it gets considerably more complicated than that, because it doesn't help to have a great engineering solution if you can't actually get it to the people who need it. And we can learn from our own history here. So a number of years ago, one of the first neuromodulation systems to be commercially available was one that provided one function, hand grasp, to people with um, tetraplegia. And the company that commercialized it went through all the processes. They went through the FDA, and they deployed it out into clinical sites. I was actually at the FDA at that time, and even though I wasn't involved in its review, I can tell you it was very exciting for me to see this technology that I had seen from, from before finally becoming a commercial um, and medical reality. The people who got the first system were daily users, because when you give people hand function, you impact them immensely. And we have some great success stories from that time period. There was, for example, there was a woman who was able to regain custody of her kids because she was able to move out of a nursing home and into an assisted living facility. And there was another person who was able to regain power of attorney over her affairs because she could show that she could sign her own name. So it was this wonderful, optimistic, and hopeful time. And this close-knit neuromodulation community watched, sort of cheering from the sidelines as it moved in. So it made what happened next all the more tragic. You know, these are small patient markets, very sophisticated technologies, which are greatly expensive to try to deploy. And after a few years of being on the market, this company finally went out of business, leaving hundreds of people out there without access to follow up. It wasn't the first time I had seen this problem. At the FDA, I had seen great technologies come all the way through to approval, only to languish in a marketplace that was very, very challenging. The healthcare system and the way we deploy new technologies is very, very challenging. And it's actually something that we should all think about. You know, none of us has access to all the great medical technologies and medical advancements. We only have access to the ones that do well in the marketplace. And when great technologies feel, fail to you know, achieve some hurdle of success, it, it's the patients who lose out. So in the case of this system, 250 people had this system, people who are still out there today. And if their charging units failed or they couldn't get a replacement part, they described losing their hand function as equivalent to having a spinal cord injury for the second time. We can't afford to do this again. But what do you do? What do you do when you have a great technology that gives people autonomy, independence, spontaneity, gives them function back, it gives them better health, but you don't have an economically feasible way to deploy it? So it's time for a lot of clear thinking and different thinking right now. And this was the problem set that compelled me out of my FDA career and into my new kick-ass career, which is to try to figure out how to lay down a new foundation for a new commercialization model. The time is really right for this, because in this case, the technology is ready to go. And we have this new ecosystem around us that can help. So we already heard today about crowdfunding, about crowdsourcing, about citizen scientists, there is a way in which the crowd can actually help facilitate the deployment of this to other people. So what we've done is we've created a new organization, uh, the Institute for Functional Restoration, that has the mission to bring great technologies to people in, a, in the smaller market. And we're doing it as a nonprofit because it allows us to give a little bit of freedom to operate outside of the normal business constraint and in a way that allows philanthropy to kind of fill in some of the gaps. It makes sense to do this, because the way the system works right now to bring medical advances forward, it's a great system that works most of the time, but it doesn't serve everybody. And there are countless small patient markets that are underserved, and some rare disorders that go completely untreated because of the way we deploy new t medical advances into the market.
you can see now it's not the technology at this point, it's the business model. No more tinkering in the lab is going to bring this any closer to the people who need it. So we need to set up this new function. So we're on the cusp of these new ideas. They haven't been deployed yet. They're shortly going to be deployed, but we have done some things already. We've already started the regulatory process. We're standing up a manufacturing facility, and we're very close to deploying this clinically for the first time again. I can tell you that you know, 30 years ago, from where they sat in history, the original pioneers of this field they couldn't have seen or predicted the biggest events that would come to shape the future of their great idea. They, they didn't know that it would take 30 years, four generations of devices, hundreds of patients, and a failed business model. And where we stand today, we also don't have a clear picture of our future. But we know that success is imperative, because without it, people living with paralysis will not see this as a future product for theirs. This great futuristic uh, concept won't actually be a part of their future. So success is imperative, and, and that's our charge. So we intend to succeed. We intend to succeed so that people living with paralysis can have their lost functions restored, so that they can go on to do what might otherwise be impossible. Thank you.